Today at 1, we're live in Ukraine as Russia invades in a major military assault by land, sea and air. It began before dawn with assaults on multiple targets in the north, south and east. There were explosions reported near major cities, including here in the capital, Kyiv. As his army moved in, Vladimir Putin had this warning for anyone trying to stand in his way. Whoever tries to interfere with us or threaten our country should know that Russia's response will be immediate and lead to such consequences that have never been experienced in history. Fearing the worst, some here are desperate to leave. Their president calls on the international community to help his country. Putin started a war against Ukraine, against the whole democratic world. He wants to destroy my country. He wants to destroy our country, everything we have been building, what we live for. NATO and Western leaders have responded with tough rhetoric to the attack. Their attempts to find a diplomatic way out of the crisis have clearly failed. Sadly, what we have warned against for months has come to pass. Despite all calls on Russia to change course and tireless efforts to seek a diplomatic solution. For all his bombs and tanks and missiles, I don't believe that the Russian dictator will ever subdue the national feeling of the Ukrainians and their passionate belief that their country should be free. We'll be live in Moscow, Brussels, Washington and from across Ukraine with the very latest. We'll also be asking what the international community can do to end the crisis and we'll take a look at the wider economic impacts of the conflict. And here in London, I'm Ben Brown with the day's other news. All remaining legal COVID restrictions have been lifted in England almost two years after the first rules were introduced. And the Queen postpones her engagements for the second time this week after testing positive for COVID. And on the BBC News Channel, stay with us for continuing coverage of Russia's invasion of Ukraine with analysis and reports from around the world. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One from the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, where just before dawn, as air raid sirens sounded here, Vladimir Putin launched an all-out assault on this country. The NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, said it was a brutal act of war of the type we thought was part of history in Europe. The Ukrainian government called it a full-scale invasion, saying there have been multiple explosions from crews and ballistic missiles in several cities, and Russian tanks and troops have poured in across the borders to the east, the south, and in the north. Russian fighter jets have also been heard in the skies. In an address to the nation, Mr. Putin said anyone who tried to interfere with Russia's operation would face consequences that have never been experienced in history. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has declared martial law. He urged his citizens not to panic, insisting his country would emerge victorious. And NATO says it's activating its defense plans, bolstering its presence in frontline states. In the last hour, Boris Johnson has said this hideous and barbaric venture must end in failure. Well, our correspondent, Paul Adams, here in Kyiv, has this roundup of the day's dramatic events. Until early this morning, some here in Kyiv doubted that he would do it. Not anymore. The West warned Vladimir Putin was about to attack. He said he had no such plans. That fiction now utterly exposed. Explosions right across this vast country. In Ivano Frankivsk, in the far southwest, a missile struck an airport. 
Unverified images from Ukraine's northern and southern borders seem to show columns of Russian armor entering from Belarus and Crimea. Within hours, Russian tanks were reported to be on the streets of Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv. Whatever Russia says, this attack will not be surgical. To the east of Kharkiv, emergency workers battle to control fires in residential buildings hit by rockets. The number of civilian casualties is rising. At Mariupol in the south, another airport on fire. This country's civilian infrastructure is being heavily struck. There are no more flights in or out. A glance at the map shows a country under attack from east to west, north to south. Earlier, a snarling Russian leader said this was all in self-defense and warned Ukrainians to lay down their arms. We will strive for the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. Russia cannot feel safe, develop and exist with a constant threat emanating from the territory of modern Ukraine. In Kyiv, Ukraine's embattled president, who must now fear for his job, appeal to the world. Putin started a war against Ukraine, against the whole democratic world. He wants to destroy my country. He wants to destroy our country, everything we have been building, what we live for. So far, all the signs are that this attack is working out exactly the way Western leaders have been warning for weeks. The country is being attacked from all directions, and the fear now has to be that some of those Russian troops are heading here to the capital. Some people aren't waiting to find out what happens next. The roads out of Kyiv jammed with traffic, most of it heading west. These people don't want to be liberated by Vladimir Putin. After weeks of extraordinary calm, this suddenly looks like panic. Mid-morning and two jets fly over the city. It's not clear whose, but it seems only a matter of time before Russia controls the air and much besides. Paul Adams, BBC News, Kyiv. Well, people here in Kyiv woke to the sound of air raid sirens up above as citizens who'd long prayed for peace now had to face war. My colleague Nick Beek has been gauging the thoughts of some of the people here to the extraordinary unfolding events. The invasion, the attack that Russia promised would never happen has now started and the Ukrainian government is urging people to stay calm and it's appealing to the international community to stop President Putin now. We soon find Lana and her mum. Russia forced them from their home in Crimea eight years ago. Now they're on the move again. It's very, very nervous and uh, I'm very scared, but uh, I, I, uh, I might be strong. After the overnight attacks from the skies, Many are taking refuge underground. Well, this feels like one of the safest places in the city today, not just because there are lots of soldiers about, but because the metro is doubling up as a bomb shelter. And overnight families have come down here. They're trying to follow the news of what's happening and they're trying to work out what they're going to do next. Two-year-old Yegor is still smiling, but his mum and dad are worried. Eight bombs. Eight bombs. Eight bombs. At a body support. In the war stopped. I'm very, very scared for my boy, Alexander says. Then both parents ask, where are NATO to help us? When the bombs started falling, sales manager Mark helped his neighbors leave their homes. He tells me he's now ready to fight on the front line and die for his country. It's only one way uh, to uh, serve our uh, country, our uh, children, our mo mothers, and uh, defend our country fr uh, from Russian occupation. Uh, and uh, we will fight uh, all day. Many are fearful of what will come next, among them Alexei. If Russia will occupy Kyiv, which I don't believe happen, because I believe in our army, well, it will be like uh, another Nazi occupation. It's still eerily quiet here in the heart of the capital. It seems many have followed government advice to stay at home. Lots of people will have also heard Russia's claim that it carried out targeted strikes 
on the Ukrainian military. I've got to tell you, people here are saying it doesn't feel like that to them. Instead, they feel that they're under attack and that President Putin has declared war on them. Nick Beek, BBC News, Kyiv. The view from here in Ukraine. Well, what about Russia? In an address on state television, Vladimir Putin claimed his country had been left no choice but to defend itself against what he suggested were threats from modern Ukraine and that Moscow would try to what he called denazify this country. From Moscow, Steve Rosenberg. From the president of Russia, a fateful decision. Vladimir Putin said military operation. But really, the Kremlin was launching a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Russian stocks plunged. The ruble hit an all-time low. Fears of conflict superseded by the shock of a war and what may come next. I think that if Putin is not stopped now in Ukraine, this war... Uh, would be the beginning of the Third World War. Vladimir Putin comes across now as a leader with an almost messianic idea to force Ukraine back into Moscow's orbit, even if that means war. What the public might think about that doesn't come into it. He seems determined to achieve his goal. In the centre of Moscow, we're against the war, she says, and we want the whole world to know that. But so far, few Russians have come out to protest. Maybe this is why. In Russia now, protests end like this. I'm sorry, I'm so shocked. <laughs> I just can't help crying. I think that most of Russians don't support this. It's horrible. And why don't they support it? Because uh, it's uh, not our war, it's war Putin, Biden or anyone else, but not our nation. I think the Ukrainian soldiers will surrender, she says, and they should. It's terrible to be at war with Ukraine. This is not a conflict the Russian public wants. This is the Kremlin's war. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Moscow. Let's talk to our... Eastern Europe correspondent Sarah Rainsford, who's uh, in eastern Ukraine. Sarah, the front line in Russia's quarrel over the last eight years with Ukraine has been where you are in the east. What's the picture looking like now? line could be moving that uh, if Ukrainian forces have been battling pro-Russian, Russian-backed forces for the past eight years and kept that line pretty much in place, now those militias are backed by the Russian army. Uh, we know that they've rolled into some areas of the Donbass and we know that there is uh, some heavy fighting going on along the, the contact line, as it's known, uh, to the south of where I am now. Uh, we know there have been civilians killed today in one area and uh, that there's, there's, as I say, heavy fighting in several places. So people here, uh, back a little way from the, the front line, are worried about what that means. They're worried about an advance by Russian troops. They're worried about the fighting coming to their doorstep. For the moment, uh, life is kind of going on as normal. There are children out and about. There are parents uh, with babies. Uh, people have gone to work today, although school was cancelled. Uh, but there's this kind of air of trepidation about what is coming because people have seen what happens when this area is taken over by the Russian-backed militias before. Now it's the Russian army who's there too, and they're worried about what exactly that means for, for their lives going forward. OK, Sarah, thank you. Sarah Rainsford there in eastern Ukraine. Let's talk to Steve Rosenberg, who's live in Moscow. Steve, in your report, you just said this was the Kremlin's war, not the people's war where you are. Is there any sense that the public understand what's going on over here and understand why it's happening? You know, talking to Russians, I think those people who watch state television, who get their news from state TV, they generally accept the message that they're receiving. And the message they're receiving is the message that Vladimir Putin delivered at his televised address uh, earlier today. In other words, that it's not Russia that's the aggressor. Russia has been forced to act in a military way 
because of Western aggression, NATO aggression, and because Ukraine has become this anti-Russia. That's how he put it. But those Russians who don't get their news from the state media, who perhaps um, go on the Internet and look at what's happening uh, online, I think they have a different view. And we've seen very few people so far publicly protesting uh, because of the fear of being arrested. You know, the situation is very difficult here for people who have a different view, a critical view of the authorities. OK, Steve, thank you for that. Steve Rosenberg there live in Moscow. I'm joined here in Kyiv by our chief international correspondent, Lee Stuse. At least we stood in this very spot last night on the 10 o'clock news and we both agreed that it felt as if things had changed. But it's quite clear that all that shuttle diplomacy over the last two, three weeks and months even, it meant nothing. Clive, it's an absolutely breathtaking moment. We're all searching for words. We're reaching back into history to try to make sense of this moment. And as the UN Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg put it, this war is on a scale and a type that we thought belonged to history. That in this year, 2022, the most advanced of intelligence, the worst of warnings, the most intensive of diplomacy, couldn't make President Putin blink. International norms are being shattered. The architecture of all our lives and a siren to remind you that war has come to Kiev in a European capital, in a city that is going right round the world. And if that feels shattering, what is happening in terms of what governs all our lives, think about the lives of tens of millions of Ukrainians shattered. Think of your a family wondering about your children's safety. You've got your suitcase packed. What are you going to do? We spoke to a philosopher who said, Ukrainians are just trying to live normal lives. I have three daughters. But quite possibly, he said, this is the end of our normal lives. And that siren has just reminded us. Sums it all up. Be Please. careful. Be careful. Indeed. Lise, thank you. Lise Doucet, our chief international correspondent there. Well, in response to Russia's invasion, as you hear the air red sirens go off here, um, NATO, the Western Military Alliance, says it's activating its defence plan. The Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, warned whatever was necessary would be done to shield member countries from aggression. With fighter jets and warships on standby, earlier the European Union said Mr Putin was bringing war back to Europe. Here's our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale. The invasion began as Western capitals slept. Their leaders woken to learn their diplomacy, their deterrence had failed. Their task now to respond to what one called Europe's darkest hours since World War II. In a recorded statement, Boris Johnson promised a massive package of economic sanctions to hobble Russia's economy. A vast invasion is underway by land, by sea and by air. And this is not in the infamous phrase, some faraway country of which we know little. Ukraine is a country that for decades has enjoyed freedom and democracy and the right to choose its own destiny. We and the world cannot allow that freedom just to be snuffed out. We cannot and will not just look away. He promised more defensive military support. Our mission is clear, diplomatically, politically, economically, and eventually militarily. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. This act of wanton and reckless aggression is an attack not just on Ukraine. It's an attack on democracy and freedom in Eastern Europe and around the world. This crisis is about the right of a free, sovereign, independent European people to choose their own future. And that is a right that the UK will always defend. Then don't ask me questions when you are speaking. In the early hours, the United Nations met in emergency session, the chamber echoing to the sound of shock and condemnation. President Putin, in the name of humanity, bring your troops back to Russia. In the name of humanity, do not allow to start in Europe what could be the worst war 
since the beginning of the century. NATO has already bolstered its eastern flank in recent days. This morning, the military alliance activated plans to pave the way for the deployment of more troops to strengthen its deterrence and defence. The Kremlin's aim is to re-establish its sphere of influence, rip up the global rules that have kept us all safe for decades, and subvert the values that we hold dear. This is the new normal for our security. Peace cannot be taken for granted. The fear now among some NATO countries, particularly in Baltic states like Estonia and other parts of Eastern Europe, is that President Putin might not stop at Ukraine. Everything we uh, were afraid of uh, that we knew from the intelligence reports actually has uh, come true. And, and this is so frightening that uh, this can happen in 2022. European Union leaders will meet later today to discuss their response. The European Commission president promised a package of tough new sanctions. It is President Putin who is bringing war back to Europe. And in these dark hours, the European Union and its people stand by Ukraine and its people. We are facing an unprecedented act of aggression by the Russian leadership against a sovereign independent country. So what further economic sanctions are on the table? Well, there are plans to restrict Russia's ability to sell its gas and other energy to the rest of the world. There may also be restrictions on Russia's ability to import crucial technology like microchips. But there's growing pressure to act fast. We'll learn more this afternoon when the Prime Minister addresses MPs at Westminster. James Landell, BBC News. We're going to get a view from Brussels now. Our Europe editor, Katja Adler, is there. Katja, we heard some of the folks from NATO there um, speaking where you are, and one wonders what the international community can do given this brazen attack on this country. Well, absolutely. And um, the EU is extremely uh, worried. As we heard there from the president of the European Commission, she said Vladimir Putin has brought war back to Europe. So all 27 EU member states are going to be, uh, their leaders are going to be coming here to Brussels tonight. Um, they're going to want to show solidarity outside towards Vladimir Putin as a warning, towards Ukraine as a sign of solidarity to saying they back them and internally as well. Because the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, via Lithuania, who neighbour Russia, they're extremely worried, feeling exposed politically, possibly also militarily. EU member states board Ukraine too and are bracing themselves for a possible refugee crisis if Ukrainians um, flee their home. There's a big bang package of sanctions that the EU is announcing today, a new package, and it says it would have further measures up its sleeve if, as it worries, Vladimir Putin continues with his aggression. OK, Katya, thank you. Katya Adler there, live in Brussels. Let's go to Washington, get the view from America. Barbara Plett Usher is there. Barbara, the events unfolding here in Ukraine, they would have taken place overnight in uh, the United States, late last night. Has there been any official reaction? Yes, President Biden last night was monitoring the situation as it evolved, and he put out a statement saying that this was a premeditated war, which would cause a lot of suffering, for which the world would hold Russia accountable. He also called President Zelensky of the Ukraine and said that the U.S. would continue uh, support and assistance for Ukraine. And within the next hour, he's going to be holding a virtual meeting with G7 leaders, no doubt, to make sure they're all on the same page about this coordinated package of sanctions that they have already agreed. We've seen some of those sanctions rolled out already this week. Uh, and Mr. Biden is going to be addressing the nation later today to talk about what further measures he's going to take. So far, he has sanctioned some Russian banks and taken steps uh, to cut Russia off from Western financing. I think we can see uh, some more of that sort of thing. It's all about going after the money, not about sending troops. What the Americans will do is support the resistance as they have been uh, with arms and weapons. OK, Barbara, thank you for that. Barbara Plett Usher in Washington. Let's get the view from Westminster. Our correspondent Nick Erdley is there. We heard Boris Johnson speaking a little earlier. Um, a sense that some more sanctions are going to be applied, but one wonders what effect that will have, if any, on President Putin. 
I think that's a really key question that many will be wrestling with in Whitehall this afternoon. Clive, we heard from Boris Johnson in the past couple of hours that he thinks that the UK's worst predictions had come true, that President Putin had now uh, launched this massive invasion without any justification for doing so. He's going to spend the next few hours speaking to international leaders. He'll be on that G7 call that Barbara was just talking about there. And then this afternoon, he will be in the House of Commons around five o'clock to outline specific sanctions that the UK is now going to introduce. You'll remember there was some criticism earlier this week that the UK hadn't gone further in the sanctions it was applying. The government here is now saying that it's intending to bring in sanctions that will hobble in time the Russian economy and expect them to include more individuals, more banks, some key Russian sectors and elements of the trade system that goes through London as well. But as you say, those are medium term uh, measures designed to hobble the Russian economy. Quite what impact that has immediately isn't clear. Yeah, indeed. Nick, thank you. Nick Hurdley there, live at Westminster. Well, what about the wider effects of what's going on here? Soon after Russian forces moved into Ukraine, there was a strong reaction from the markets right around the world. Now, the price of oil surged past $100 a barrel, hitting its highest level for more than seven years. With consumers already facing high energy prices, the cost of UK natural gas has soared by 30%. Europe gets nearly half of its gas from Russia. And there were steep falls on stock markets across Europe. The UK's FTSE 100 opened 2.5% down, with Russia's MOEX index plunging by 45%. Let's get some more uh, reaction to all this from our business correspondent, Theo Leggett. Theo, it's clear to everyone that events taking place here could have far-reaching effects far on reaching all of effects. us right around the world far-reaching effects and on UK consumers among others. I mean, the biggest impact we've seen so far has been on the energy markets, and there's a clear reason for that. Russia is one of the world's biggest suppliers of crude oil. It's also a major supplier of natural gas and supplies about 40% of Europe's gas needs. Now, a lot of that oil and gas actually comes through Ukrainian territory. So there is concern that these supplies could be disrupted either through political means, through sanctions or counter sanctions, or because of problems within the country itself. So that's pushed up gas prices in a very significant way. They're now actually up around 40% on the day, and we've seen the oil price spike at more than $105 a barrel. What this means is more expensive oil translates into higher manufacturing costs for companies. Factories have to pay more for the supplies they need, higher transport costs as well, and higher prices for fuel for ordinary motorists. So uh, petrol prices in the UK, for example, are already at very high levels. This does feed through into the pockets of ordinary people. OK, Theo, thank you for that. Theo Leggett there with the wider economic implications of Russia's attack on Ukraine. Um, we're going to get more from here in Kiev in a few moments. But first, let's get some more of the day's news from Ben back in London in the studio. Ben. Clive, thank you very much indeed. All remaining legal COVID restrictions in England have been lifted nearly two years after the first rules were introduced. It means people who test positive are no longer required by law to self-isolate, although they are still advised to do so. Coronavirus restrictions have already been lifted in Northern Ireland, but will be more gradually loosened in Scotland and Wales, as our health reporter Jim Reid now reports. From today, there'll be no more of this in England. Anyone who tests positive for COVID will no longer have to self-isolate in law or risk a fine if they don't. Instead, that legal requirement will be replaced by guidance to stay at home for at least five days. Close contacts of those infected are no longer advised to take a lateral flow test for seven days. And a £500 support payment for those on low incomes who test positive will be ended. The Prime Minister has said this is about learning to live with the virus two years into this pandemic. And Mr Speaker, it is time that we got our confidence back. We don't need laws to compel people to be considerate to others. We can rely on that sense of responsibility towards one another, providing practical advice in the knowledge that people will follow it to avoid infecting loved ones and others. 
In London, the requirement to wear a mask on the tube and other transport is also lifted from today. And from April the 1st, free COVID testing will come to an end for most people in England. Some charities, scientists and doctors are worried restrictions are being relaxed too quickly. COVID remains pretty high in circulation around the country. And what NHS leaders are worried about is that if too many of our precautions are relaxed at one time, then there will be an increase in the transmission of COVID. Now, for lots of people, the current uh, strain of COVID-19 uh, can often have quite mild effects, but that is not the case for everyone. And that's particularly not the case for people with other vulnerabilities. The changes today apply to England only. Restrictions in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are being lifted at different speeds as the Omicron wave of this virus passes. Jim Reid, BBC News. Students who start university next year could be paying off their loans for 40 years after graduating under new government plans for England. Under the current system, loans are written off after 30 years. The government says extending the repayment period will reduce the bill for taxpayers. But Labour says it will hit those on low incomes the hardest. The Queen has postponed more engagements after testing positive for Covid last weekend. She called off virtual audiences on Tuesday, but she did have a call with the Prime Minister yesterday. Buckingham Palace says she's now postponed two more virtual audiences scheduled for today, but she is continuing with light duties. Right, let's go back uh, to my colleague Clive Murray with the very latest from Ukraine. Clive. Yeah, Ben, thank you. Um, we heard air raid sirens just, uh, what, in the last 10, 15 minutes or so. So we've had to put our flight jackets on, um, if you're wondering why this is happening. Um, we're going to get a p the perspective now from our security correspondent, Frank Gardner. Um, because, Frank, I'd like to know, there are, there's a lot of hyperbole out there about this being the worst conflict in Europe since the end of the Second World War and so on and so forth. Just put things into perspective for us. What are your thoughts? Sure. Well, it certainly looks like being the worst conflict in Europe this century. Let's not forget that a few years before that, in the mid-90s, there was a very bad conflict in the Balkans that sucked in Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, uh, and so on. But the real hyperbole that is being talked about that I think is probably rattling a lot of people all over the world is that the talk of this as being the beginning of World War III, and some of the loudest voices saying that are Ukrainian voices. Now, I think that's going too far at the moment because NATO is not involved directly in this. This is a conflict within Ukraine's borders for now, and NATO is desperately hoping that it stays that way. They want two things. They want Russia to withdraw its troops and go back to its side of the border, and they want to act as a deterrent to make sure that President Putin does not cross into Poland or the Baltic states and invade a NATO country, because that would be a prelude to war, something much wider. Indeed. Frank, thank you for uh, that analysis there, Frank Gardner. Um, let's get a final word from our chief international correspondent, Lee Doucette, who's with me again. We heard the air raid sirens. We've put on our flak jackets. One wonders what the people of this city, and indeed right across this country, are now thinking. They prayed for peace, and with all the diplomacy over the last few weeks and months, they hoped that would be the case. Now we're in a major conflict. The siren has spoken. The siren spoke live in our broadcast live. And that siren, not only did it strike fear in the hearts of all the Ukrainians being told to stay at home today, and some still bravely went to work, a siren telling them, be careful, something even more dangerous could come. But that siren was also heard across the UK and around the world. Everyone watching this broadcast didn't need to be reminded that we're in Kiev with these beautiful, magnificent St. Michael's Cathedral and a siren, an emergency siren, is saying that the war is getting worse and the war that is having not just a profound impact here, but is shattering the norms that govern all our lives and have done so for decades. We are nothing less than turning a new chapter in history. Indeed. Lise, thank you. Our chief international correspondent there. We're going to get uh, the weather news now and Thomas has the details. Hi, Thomas. 
Clive, thank you. Um, some chilly air spreading across the UK right now. You can see uh, from these uh, colder northwesterly uh, winds uh, on the graphic and uh, we've had uh, sleet and snow showers across many parts of northern Britain. Uh, this has prompted uh, the Met Office to issue a yellow warning for parts of Scotland and also Northern Ireland, um, snow and lightning. So these uh, really quite squally, gusty showers are, are quite vigorous, um, carried in by a strong wind, bringing uh, the threat of lightning in places as well. So in, in some areas, uh, even quite dramatic weather. Um, the snow is settling, but mostly across the hills, not exclusively though, 10, 20 centimetres across the highest tops of the highlands there, perhaps around the Pennines too. But, you know, it's uh, a case of some sunny spells around today as well, certainly not rain uh, or snowing all the time, in fact uh, quite the opposite, but the winds are very strong so it does feel on the cold side, gusts of 40 uh, miles an hour combined with temperatures of say only 4 or 5 degrees uh, really uh, do make it um, pretty chilly, so yes a cold spell um, right uh, over us right now. Um, through the course of tonight um, the showers uh, will continue at least for a time, but uh, the thing is that a high pressure is starting to build uh, from the south through the early hours of Friday, so that means that the wind winds will slow, the, the showers will become less frequent and that promises uh, a much um, calmer, brighter day uh, for Friday. And you can see that high pressure on the weather map here building in from the southwest keeping the uh, more uh, the worse weather in the North Atlantic at bay. So I think on Friday for the bulk of the country, and this includes much of Scotland as well, it is going to be a very uh, decent day. Uh, the winds will be much lighter. It'll feel a little bit warmer or, or, or less cold, I should say, uh, for the north of the country. Temperatures may be around 8 degrees in Glasgow, 11 in the south. And the weekend is looking promising. I have to hand you now back to uh, Clive. Thomas, thank you for that. Thomas Schaffernacker there. Well, that's it from the BBC News at One here in Kyiv on a momentous day. Goodbye from me. Now on BBC One, time for the news where you are. Have a very good afternoon.